G'day mates, Captain Doug here. Welcome to Houseboats 101. Houseboats contain a whole host of systems aboard, making them a self-contained, fully functional habitat. They have electrical systems, mechanical plants, plumbing, and even sewer systems. In this episode, we're going to examine the electrical system in a houseboat. We'll look at the various supplies, both AC and DC, power distribution, and any special maintenance requirements. Our houseboat effectively has four sources of electrical power, shore power, generator, inverter, and batteries. Most houseboats get their main source of power from a dock pedestal like this one. This is called the shore power. The marina will meter this source and present you with a bill for electricity every month. Our power pedestal has two 50 amp circuits, so we can have two 50 amp power cables for a total of 100 amps available for the boat. Each of these circuits is two phase 230 volt AC, giving us effectively 23 kilowatts of power. This is an important number to remember when we start to look at the various electrical loads we have on the boat. The power cables connect to the boat via twist lock connectors in a front deck locker. Some boats have their power connectors on the outside edge of the boat. It's a good idea to occasionally feel the power plugs while the boat is drawing current. Maybe while the air conditioner is running. If they feel warm, you may have a loose connection or broken wire strand inside the plug. Something to get fixed in a hurry before a fire can start. The second source of power for the boat is the generator, located in the engine bay under the back deck. This boat has a 15 kilowatt generator. At 230 volts, that means it can generate about 65 amps of power. Remember, the shore power can provide about 23 kilowatts of power, so the generator at 15 kilowatts cannot run the full load of electrical appliances at the same time. So when you are running on the generator, you need to balance your power needs against your power available. If you know you're going to put a substantial load on the generator, let the motor warm up a few minutes before applying the load. Our generator uses about one to one and a half gallons of fuel per hour while running, and it comes from one of these engine fuel tanks. So don't run yourself out of fuel when away from the dock for a long period. We'll look at generator maintenance in another episode. The third source of power for the boat comes from the inverter system. The inverter takes DC power from a special set of batteries and inverts it into regular AC power for use by AC appliances in the boat. This allows the boat to have some AC power even when away from the shore power and the generator is not running. 
Our boat has six 6 volt golf cart batteries connected in a series parallel combination to provide 12 volt DC to the inverter, producing about 2.5 kilowatt output. More powerful inverters will use batteries in a 24 volt combination to reduce the DC current required by the inverter. Remember, we can get 23 kilowatts from shore power or 15 kilowatts from the generator, but only 2.5 kilowatts from the inverter. Inverters on boats will never be able to match the capacity of shore power or even a generator. For every kilowatt of power, a 12 volt inverter battery must supply about 100 amps of current. To put that in perspective, this kettle requires about 1.2 kilowatts just to boil some water. So it would pull over 100 amps from the batteries while it's on. We'll look more at inverter loads when we examine the switchboard. The inverter can also operate as a charger when AC supply is restored, recharging the batteries ready for the next use. The last source of power for the boat is the house batteries. These two batteries, connected in parallel, provide 12 volt DC power to the boat's switchboard and separately to the boat's toilets and bilge pumps. The house batteries are located in the engine bay. There are special circuit breakers here for powering the toilets and bilge pumps. So why are they here and not in the 12 volt switchboard up front? Well. The toilet macerators and pumps require a fair amount of current, necessitating pretty thick wires running to them. So I guess they don't want to run these wires all the way to the front of the boat to the switchboard and then back down the boat to the toilets. The bilge pumps are wired from here because they don't want people accidentally turning off the pumps from a switchboard and leaving the boat at risk of sinking. The house batteries are constantly fed by one of two chargers located below deck. These chargers are fed by either shore power or the generator when it's running. Unless you have sealed batteries, you should occasionally check the levels of electrolyte in each battery, topping up with distilled water if necessary. While we're on the topic of batteries, there are three different types of battery construction that can be used. Good old wet cell batteries like these, which can be vented or sealed, the cheapest type. Gel batteries, where the electrolyte is actually a gel rather than a liquid, more expensive. And AGM or absorbed glass batteries, which use a fiberglass mat soaked in electrolyte the most expensive. All models have two types, a cranking battery type that can produce high currents for short periods, like starting an engine, and a deep cycle type designed to provide a lower current but over a longer time. I'm not going to go any further into batteries. That discussion could take up a whole episode. All these sources of power, shore power, generator, inverter and battery need a way to be distributed to the boat. This is where the switchboards come in. Our boat has an AC switchboard and a separate DC switchboard. At the top of the AC switchboard are two meters 
and switches to connect them to the various supply circuits. We'll come back to them in a minute. Just below the meters are the two main circuit breakers, one for each of the shore power cables. However, since the generator supply also comes in here, there must be a way of preventing the generator supply from being connected to the shore power supply, or things could go boom. The generator supply only has one circuit, unlike shore power where we have two. So the switchboard has a lockout system to prevent cross-connection of the supplies. I'll show you how this works, but first we must start the generator. We can start the generator from the control switches on the switchboard, assuming you have run the engine room blower for a few minutes first. The middle switch, called preheat, prepares the generator to run. Hold this switch on for about 10 to 15 seconds. Then, while still holding the preheat switch on, start the generator by pushing on the start switch until you hear the generator start or you see the generator power available light come on. Then, release the start switch, but still hold down the preheat switch for another 10 seconds. We'll go through this procedure again in a later episode, when we're preparing the boat to leave the dock. To run the boat on the generator, you must first turn off the shore power, then slide the lock out to cover the shore power side, revealing the generator breaker. Turning on the generator breaker now connects the generator power to load groups previously run by shore number one supply. To get the generator to run shore number two loads, we must first disconnect from shore number two and slide over the lock plate to reveal a transfer breaker. The transfer breaker connects shore number two loads to whatever is powering the shore number one loads, in this case, the generator. So now the boat is totally running on the generator. To get back onto shore power again, just reverse the procedure. Open the transfer breaker, slide the lockout plate over, and close shore number two breaker. Open the generator breaker, slide the lock plate over, and close shore number one breaker. You can then stop the generator by holding in the stop switch until you hear the generator stop, or the generator light goes completely out. So let's look at the load circuits on the switchboard. This group says it's AC load group 1 on leg A, and this group is identified as AC load group 1 on leg B. Does this switchboard actually have legs? Remember, each shore power cable that comes in at 230 volts is actually made up of two 115 volt circuits called phases. So leg A is one of the 115 volt phases and leg B is the other one. That leaves us with these circuit breakers here in the middle. Why are they separate? Well, these circuits use both phases of the incoming power supply combined together to give 230 volts. High power devices like the washer and dryer, the air conditioner, hot tub and the like require 230 volts for their supply. On the right side of the switchboard, we see a similar arrangement for shore power number two, but below that, is a group that comes from either shore number two or the inverter. These are the circuits you want to remain on if you lose shore power or you stop the generator while away from the dock. Things like the refrigerator, televisions, fans, some galley outlets and the like. 
The inverter will automatically switch over the supply from the number 2 power to inverter power on loss of incoming AC. So let's go back and look at those meters we saw at the beginning. These meters can be used to check if you have the correct AC voltage coming into the boat and to check how much current is being drawn by the loads connected. Below the AC switchboard is the DC switchboard. This switchboard distributes power from the house batteries we saw in the engine bay to the various DC circuits throughout the boat. This boat has both AC and DC lighting in each of the bedrooms and the bathrooms. When you're staying overnight away from the dock and you don't want to run the generator all night, DC lighting can be used. There are also circuits here to supply power to both of the helm stations for things like metering, navigation lights, depth sounder and the like. The water slide pump gets its power from here, as does the fresh water supply pump. The last electrical item to show you, oh about time you say, has to do with the hot tub. Those of you still awake may have noticed a breaker for the hot tub here on the switchboard. I know, you're yelling at the video, that's not up to electrical code for hot tubs. Hold your horses mate, Somerset took care of this by adding a separate GFI breaker box just below the hot tub in the top guest cabin closet. Clever eh? Took me a while to find it too. Okay, so that's it for the electrical systems on a houseboat. We'll look at some of the items actually using electricity in a later episode. But until then, look for episode 4 when we will examine the plumbing on a houseboat. Cheers, mates. <laughs>